Hey there, I am Dee, and welcome to my first edition of Book vs. Movie. It is a little known fact that out of every single movie ever made, well over 70% of them are based on a book. And more often than not, the movie doesn't even remotely resemble the book it was based on. Understandably so, because with a book you have a lot of freedom which you don't have when you're making a movie. So naturally, the movie has to be at least a little different from the book it was based on. But does it being different make it better? Should you take your time read the book, or are you better off seeing the movie? Well, that's what this is all about. And for today, let's talk about Clive Barker's Hellbound Heart versus Clive Barker's Hellraiser. First, a little history. Clive Barker is a British award-winning novelist and short story writer who's best known for his work in both fantasy and horror. His style can be described as deliberately blurring the distinction between polar opposites, such as Hell and Heaven, or Pain and Pleasure. In the mid-80s he wrote and directed the movie Hellraiser that was based on his own short story The Hellbound Heart. Now it should be noted that generally the original writer is never involved when making the movie, not even as a creative consultant. In this case, the original writer is more than involved. So we can assume that with this, Barker might have tried to make a better version of what he had already written. Correct a few mistakes, uh, making two scenes out of one, you get the idea. So intent was Frank upon solving the puzzle of Le Marchand's box that he didn't hear the great bell begin to ring. Though he'd been told the box contained wonders, there simply seemed to be no way into it. Alright, I'll take it back. He's not making one scene out of two, but two scenes out of one. I mean, rather than having just one scene where someone is solving the puzzle box, the movie shows an additional scene where we find out how he got the box in the first place. So by now I'm guessing you, you're getting the point. What works for a book doesn't always work for a movie. So with all that out of the way, let's take a look at the Hellbound Heart and Hellraiser, beginning with the main antagonist, Frank. He's one of two siblings. In the novel, he's the elder. In the movie, he's the younger. So... In the novel, he implies that the elder always know best, quite arrogantly, I might add. Whereas in the movie, he's saying, you know, the younger just don't know any better. Um, which is it? Anyway, he's the one that solves the infamous puzzle box, which causes... Well, that. Anyway, this is how it happens in the movie. How does the book handle it? The smell of burning was only the beginning. Perfumes he had scarcely noticed until now were suddenly overpoweringly strong. Okay? His ears were no less sensitive. The air that broke against his eardrums was a hurricane the flatulence in his bowels was a thunder. That's a little bit over the... But there was worse. The eyes. Oh, God in heaven. He had never guessed they could be such torment. Everywhere. Sight. Appalled, he shut his eyes. But there was more inside than out. He felt close to exploding. <laughs> and we haven't even gotten to the hooks and chains yet. Now, you can imagine that he doesn't get out of this in one piece. Literally. So it takes a little blood sacrifice for him to come back. Now, how the blood is spilt is irrelevant. It's what happens after that is more important. The wall was alight. Or rather, something behind it burnt with a cold luminescence which made the solid brick seem insubstantial stuff. The spectacle of the unfolding wall had now ceased, and she saw something flicker across the brick. It was human, she saw, or had been, but the body had been ripped apart and sewn together again, with most of its pieces either missing or twisted and blackened as if in a furnace. 
So you can imagine that he needs a new skin. So what does he do? His accomplice Julia, who we'll talk about later, lures men over to the house and he'd take the flesh from their bones. In the book it makes perfect sense, in the movie... So he needed a few drops of blood to become that, but needed four men to restore the rest? The book implied that those drops of blood just opened a gate helping Frank escape from wherever he was? What was wrong with that? Hm, can't be helped. Let's move on to Julia. Julia the sweet, the beautiful. The winner of glances and kisses, it seemed to Kirsty that the woman was incapable of ugliness. Wow, I'd love to see that woman. Place. You know. That is a woman incapable of ugliness? You'd have a lot more credibility if you used her instead. Granted, she wasn't even born yet, but that's besides the point. Even as I watched the movie, which I admittedly did before reading the book, I couldn't understand how any of the men she lured to, the, to her house were possibly even attracted to her. But, to be fair, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and we are talking about a middle-aged woman, so she might be attractive to a middle-aged man. Also, when you read in a book a woman incapable of ugliness, you can pretty much imagine such a woman for yourself. But with a movie, they actually have to show you a woman. And, let's face it, it's hard to find a woman that everyone would unanimously find pretty. So, moving on. We can make it work here. I've got a terrific job, you're back on your own turf. We can be happy. All right, all right. So what's the argument? No argument. I really hate movie Julia. When you're reading the book, you can read her thoughts, so you know she secretly hates her husband. But in the movie, it's like you can't even hide it from Ro- I was about to say Rory, because that's his name in the book, but it's Larry in the movie. Let's call him Leroy, just to be safe. Next we have... Kirsty. In the book, she's a friend of Leroy. In the movie, she's suddenly his daughter. I don't quite understand why he'd change that. I mean, I liked the little subplot in the book where Kirsty has this secret crush on Leroy. It would explain why she'd investigate Julia. On the other hand, Don't you remember me? It said. She shook her head. Frank! came the reply. This is brother Frank. She had met Frank only once, at Alexandra Road. I see. So if he stuck to the idea that she was just a friend, chances are she wouldn't even remember Frank. But now that she's Leroy's daughter, she would recognize her uncle only too well. So okay, I understand a little change. Now, let's talk about the character everyone remembers, Pinhead. For all nitpickers and Clive Barker, I am aware that Pinhead's not the character's name. However, neither the book or the movie refers to him by name, assuming he even has one. But Pinhead is the name that most self-proclaimed fans know him by, so let's just stick to that 
to keep it simple. Now, how different is he here from the book? Well... Every inch of its head had been tattooed with an intricate grid, and at every intersection of horizontal and vertical axis a jeweled pin driven through to the bone. In appearance, not very much. As for everything else, however... In the movie, he's depicted as the leader of these so-called Cenobites, whereas in the book, there's little to no hint there even is some kind of hierarchy among them. Additionally, make him confess yourself, and maybe we won't tear your soul apart. Doesn't really have as much of a ring to it as... We'll tear your soul apart. He sure nailed that one. Its voice was light and breathy, the voice of an excited girl. I got some mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, I understand why they used a different voice in a movie, but on the other, akin to Barker's style, the genders of these Cenobites are supposed to be ambiguous. So I really wonder why he'd change that. Now I actually had a chance to talk to the guy who portrayed Pinhead about this, and this is what he had to say. I think it would, be, it would seem slightly silly. You can, you can say that in a novel and it's fine, because you can kind of make it work in your imagination. Um, I didn't really talk or have conversations with Clive about the voice. Um, I'd read The Hellbound Heart, I knew I wasn't doing that. I just went with the voice I heard in my head when I was reading the script. And apparently everyone was happy with it, so... Interesting. Now let's bear that in mind for a moment and move on to the plot. Not much to say as they're virtually the same. However, if I have to nitpick on a few details, here's something that happens in both the book and the movie. No! Give me that. Don't take away the thing that summons those I'm running away from? You can have it! One other difference is that Kirsty is being stalked by some kind of hermit. Um... why? It's Monty Python's Flying Circus. <laughs> Interesting. So this hermit is in cahoots with the guy who gave Frank the box in the first place. But then, why is it stalking Kirsty? Uh, why not just be on a stakeout around Frank's house, or for that matter, why not just pick up the box once Frank has already used it? And while we're on the subject of differences... Kircher told me there would be five of you, Frank said. The engineer will arrive should a moment merit, came to reply. The engineer? Based on how four of these Cenobites are described, it's safe to say that all four of them are in the movie. But as for the engineer, well, he's mentioned, but we don't know what he looks like. So why won't the movie show us? Admit that's an unusual monster, but that is supposed to be the engineer? Okay, to be fair, the movie doesn't describe him as such, so I really shouldn't be that disappointed. Anywho, time for the big finish. The book leaves quite a bit to the imagination, which for someone like me isn't that much of a problem. 
Which is a problem with the movie, as it actually has to show you everything. However, some of the little quirks that the book had were improved in the movie, and at times the movie actually added a little more to the story. So yes, both had their faults, but both had their merits. But in the end, which one's the best? I'll go with The Hellbound Heart. This was D. I'm signing off.